All right, thanks for joining us today. I wanna to welcome Nick Selby, a good friend who has spoken at CornCon before. He's the Chief Security Officer at Paxos Trust Company, and he's gonna to speak today on Tech Debt Burndown, Kill It With Fire. So I'll stop sharing my screen and you can share yours if you want, Nick. Thanks for coming. Outstanding. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me okay? Everything, everything is good? Yep, I can hear you. Excellent. I'm going to see if I can actually do this since I've never actually, believe it or not, done a, um, a Zoom before. So am I, you guys see my screen and everything's... Yep, your screen covered? looks great. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, so yeah, burning technical debt, it's something that we all have. And um, I get asked about it quite a bit because it's, it's, a, it's a big focus of mine. I will jump right in and uh, hopefully we'll get some questions at the end. Um, I am, as uh, John said, CSO of Paxos Trust. We're, uh, um, we have something to do with blockchain. Um, actually, we empower uh, large financial organizations by providing blockchain infrastructure to do really cool things. And we also have a, um, a couple of the biggest stable coins out there tied to uh, gold and uh, US dollars. Right before Paxos, I was at uh, the NYPD where I was a director of cyber intelligence and uh, investigations. And I also was a detective in the Midlothian Police Department in Texas. I was also a, um, a I had a startup in Texas um, for, for about five years. And uh, that, that fed some of my knowledge about tech debt, um, for, you know, the hard way. Uh, but I also spent about 10 years doing uh, incident response. So, you know, if you saw me, something terrible had just happened. Uh, and prior to that, in 2005, I established the security practice at 451 Research, or 451 Group, which is now 451 Research. Um, my son and I were talking last night about tech debt, and he was, we were sort of going back and forth about whether this is a, a digital phenomenon, whether this is a phenomenon of the, the, the new, you know, cloud world. And no, it's, it's actually a human phenomenon. And uh, we were talking, and he just immediately said, oh, yeah, The Great Escape. Is, is really a good example of that. And we both read the book and seen the movie. And um, while they're different, there's, there's a few things that actually are, are the same. And he's absolutely right. It's a perfect example of technical debt. And, and the reason I say that, um, you know, you probably know the, the basic story, which is a, uh, an officer, a prisoner camp in World War II. And there were current Canadians, Americans, Brits, and Australians. Uh, they were all officers, uh, mostly aviators. They, they really wanted to innovate in, in how they did escapes. And they wanted to come up with a new product to get more people out than ever. The most important thing that they wanted to do was not actually get the people out, but they wanted to make the Germans use too much of their resources, um, burn up all their resources at home so that uh, their, their comrades in arms could, could launch uh, successful attacks. And, and the way they thought about this was they said, let's, let's build a lot of tunnels in a place that the Germans put us with sandy soil so that we couldn't tunnel at all. And boy, will that be innovative and surprising. And so they, they began work on three simultaneous tunnels they called Tom, Dick, and Harry. There was actually a fourth called George that they didn't, they didn't end up uh, doing. But um, they, they pushed really hard to get all the features. And the, the features were that you, know, you had to be able to fit a man, but they had to make, some, they had to make a, a bunch of compromises as they went. They had to make them uh, less deep than they, than they wanted. They had to shore them up less, less than they wanted. And they had to make them thinner. and um, uh, there were more choke points than they wanted. And so they, they, they suffered from collapses. They suffered from them getting stuck in the, in the narrow tunnel and, and a bunch of other challenges. But in the end, 77 of the expected 250 people managed to get through. 76 actually escaped. The 77 have actually surrendered. Um, there were 600 people who worked on the thing. Uh, so what I'm saying is, is that by shoring up the infrastructure, even when you have not great infrastructure, you can make things work if there is technical debt. It's just that they don't work as well and that they don't work as safely. Um, if you take a look at some of, the, some of the stuff that they did to shore up their infrastructure, I mean, they stole everything. And that was actually part of the downfall. Part of the ways that they got caught a couple of times was they were just taking everything to try to get the infrastructure to work, starting off as small as they could, but, but building up as they needed to. So to define tech debt, uh, I'm just going to say that it is and, and we're all guilty of this. I was guilty of this as a CEO. I, I, you know, I want to make a product and the first thing I want to do is get it in customer hands. So I need something that's as close to MVP as possible. And so I just want to get there as fast as I can and damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Let's just go and get those features done. So we're going to accept things for now. We're going to accept things or ignore things. And that is the infrastructural and configuration or, or information security work that we delay 
to let us focus on what we think is important, right? To, to get the thing that we're building in the hands of the people we want to use it so that we can bring in money. Um, so our revenue teams or our business people, they're telling us what the customers want um, and we're just moving ahead as fast as we can. If you've spent any time in information security or in, in, in information technology, you know that nothing is more permanent than a temporary fix. Um, and, and so a lot of these fixes that a lot of these uh, things that we accept accumulate and the, you end up with this huge backlog of accumulation of technical debt. And this is aggravated by the fact, and it's just a fact that no matter how much you love our employees, no matter how much we love our coworkers, people leave, people move on to different things, people get fired, uh, people get sick. And we try to do knowledge transfer. We try to share the information that we, that we have and know, but we're, when I'm doing that, if I'm a developer or if I'm an application guy or I'm a business guy, I'm talking about the stuff that works. I'm talking about the stuff that I think is important. And a lot of the compromises that I might've made along the way don't get knowledge transferred. So it's very, very common. And I would see this all the time in incident response that you know I'm dealing with a team who inherited uh, a group of a bunch of technology from a team who's no longer there and they inherited it from a team who's no longer there and they inherited it from a team. So you, you've actually got no built-in cultural uh, institutional knowledge of how your technology got there. And so people start to just assume things about the bedrock on which they're working. And if you don't stir it up, and if you don't look to see whether those, those assumptions are true, you can get into some real trouble. Developers too, and you'd think that developers are in the best position to, uh, to see these things. And you know, in some ways they are, but the, the problem is developers sort of, they like to see the, the, the things that are working and, and make them better. Um, and they're not really interested in the things that they haven't, that they don't need to worry about because developers are constantly trying to push forward. They're very creative people and they want to move forward. And it's, it's completely understandable that that's how they go. So like, if I, if I think about, you know, and I've said this before in, in different places, but you know, developers business, they're, they're a lot like the, the traffic cops. They, they just want to keep things going. Let's just get everything going, move as fast as you possibly can. Let's just get where we're going and everything will be okay. And security people are much more like homicide investigators. Whoa, let's just slow down and let me just ask a few questions. Now, there's a natural tension that gets built between these two groups, and that's great. That, that should be there. The, the problem is when one group is too powerful. Uh, and, and usually one group is too powerful because senior executives are not recognizing that you need that balance. You need to be able to have really good and cordial and collaborative relationships across both groups. So you don't want the security guy having too much in, input to the extent that they are Dr. No, that you know, security is where everything goes to die and they never want to do anything and they're just no fun at all. Because as soon as you get into that, what will end up happening is your product manager goes, um, they'll just start to go around you and they'll just, you'll end up with not, not just technical debt, but you'll also end up with shadow IT. And you'll end up with a whole bunch of other things that are part and parcel of security having too much influence or security uh, workers who don't understand what is trying to be created. They don't understand the business. And I know we always say, you know, hey, we're security, we should, we should understand the business. But a lot of us don't. We're just focused on what you can't do. Um, if you go the other way, then the security guy gets kind of left out. The developers are running the show and the security guy is just yelling until he's blue in the face. And if you've got a security person with integrity, they're gonna leave. And, and you're gonna keep going through people uh, until you find somebody who isn't gonna leave and then you're just gonna have somebody who's basically powerless. And that's not good either. So finding that good balance between the developers, business and security is really important. That's gotta come from the top down. It can't be, um, it can't be something that is imposed by just the security guy or mid-level management, um, <coughs> excuse me, bottom up and top down or it fails. CEO has to put his arm around the security guy and say, yes, this is, this is what we're doing. I heard this this morning. We were um, watching a, a video interview of this. Uh, he's a guy who makes tools by hand and everything. And, and he had on Carolyn Baker, who writes a bunch of books. And, and this quote about the death of uncertainty and the trauma and a torrent of trauma, uh, something that she was talking about, uh, the pandemic, we all felt this when this happened. And, and I know that with technical debt, that can happen too. So when you've accumulated technical debt and you might not even notice it and everything seems like it's just humming along and you're all, you know, everything's right down the middle. And then all of a sudden you crash into a tree. 
that phrase is perfect for the dynamic that happens in companies because people would just get, they really get stunned and they don't quite know where to go. And they, and they have to go back and start questioning things they've never actually questioned. Everything that they counted on, you know, it's, it's kind of like if your water gets turned off in your house, it's really a surprise. And I don't know if it's, it's just happened to you, but when it does, it's, it's really a shock or the internet goes out. This stuff is all shifted. That is the moment where it's really a, you know, come to your, your day to here moment where you suddenly are really rethinking everything about the decisions that you've made. And, and I think it's pretty clear that, you know, we're on Zoom right now. <laughs> we don't, um, We've seen that Zoom, like many, many companies, um, had a product that they wanted to get out. And, and what they wanted to do was end the horror and pain of WebEx. They wanted to end the horror and pain of other video calls. Video stuff is terrible. I love Zoom. I was just talking to my friend Ian, who I'll mention later. And he was like, I look better on Zoom. I sound better on Zoom. Right? Zoom is awesome. But they were so interested in getting all their stuff out there that they forgot about this basic this bedrock, this, this foundational stuff. And it cost them dearly as soon as it became, it, it went from something that was nice to have to an absolutely essential resource. And that's when all the security people started playing with it. That's when all the criminals started playing with it. And suddenly it comes out that there's a lot of stuff shifting. The ground has shifted underneath Zoom's feet. And you know, I'll talk about a little bit about that later. So if I think about a technical debt life cycle, um, you have a company that's got a great idea. This is gonna be awesome. We're gonna get it into the hands of the customers. And so you, you get something out there that's basically, you know, MVP or something, and then there's a reaction and the customers always say the same thing, like, well, you know, this is pretty good, you know, I like it. Um, like it to do a few more things. And when they say that, of course, the business is like, oh, of course, we're going to do a few more things. You know, that's absolutely what we're going to do. And so we start to make more and more of those compromises because they, by the way, they still haven't paid us, right? They're just, we're just trying to get this in the hands so that they'll say it's great so that we can go to our other people. And so like our business people are like, this is awesome. Keep going, keep pushing, keep pushing. And then you eventually and absolutely without fail, you get to a crash. And wow, we, we just never thought of it. So you know, that's, that's the definition of technical debt. I hope that uh, everybody is, is on the same page and you probably recognize a lot of the things about this um, because as I said, it's human nature to, to accumulate technical debt. Uh, it's, it's actually not human nature to, to not do it. It's, it's actually really difficult to, to, to tune our minds to not build technical debt. Um, and it, it, it's not just in tech, it's in everything we do. So plowing ahead, so what the hell do we do about it? That's, that's actually why we're here. Um, and I'm sorry, it's boring. This is actually the very boring bit about what you have to do because <laughs> the only way to deal with tech debt is to look for tech debt. And if you're not looking for it, you're just not going to find it. You're not going to see it until it, until it finds you. So um, you need the smartest people in your organization, the smartest people on your teams. You need to get together and you have to gain the executive authority to actually do this and take time out of all the things that, that are on your sprint list, all the things that you're supposed to be doing and say, no, we're going to actually spend some time and we're going to be looking at this because we need to understand where we are and just, just get a level set. What is the reality in our organization? How good are we? How bad are we? What are the deltas between how good we think we are and how bad we actually are? Um, or how good we think we are and how great we actually are? Whatever it is, you need to know what that is. Um, I like to go across the, the different um, teams and find maybe some, you know, so there's some obvious people like engineering managers, security managers, people like that. But there's also some non-obvious people in, in almost every company and almost every group. There's a guy who everybody goes to because he knows where the bodies are buried. There's a guy or, or a woman who knows where uh, all the decisions that have been made over time, they're the person people seek out when they need to fix something personal. Like they just bought a new watch that is really complicated and they'll go to this person, right? That's the person you want helping you find tech debt. Um, you want the person who actually thinks that this stuff is cool, not because it's security or not because it's development, but because it's interesting. Get them, that's really important. In the beginning, you're looking for low-hanging fruit. You've got to start somewhere. Um, you know, when you're when you're eating an elephant, you should just start with the first bite. Um, start with the low-hanging fruit. Look at the scans that you have of things that are public. Get scans of things that are public. This should not cost you any money. You should be able to find this actually at, at almost no cost, right? But but take a look at what's showing up. Like, are you actually allowing stuff to, to go out uh, using SSL version three? I I mean, I hope it's not this, uh, any older than that. 
Um, are you still a TLS one? Like just find out, make a catalog, show what it is that's facing forward and this is how they talk and this is what they do. Do this absolutely everywhere. Um, what do all your domains look like? When, how many domains do you have? Who holds your domains? Where do you, uh, you know, where do you register them and who has the registry of domains and who's making sure that, that those things are all done? Uh, correctly, are, are you spending too much money there? Is that is that tech debt? Uh, you know, just just a simple way, right? Is some of them at GoDaddy and some of them are at Google, or do you actually have a plan? So figure that out and, and write that down. What do IP intelligence firms think about you? How do you look to the security community? Do you show up in uh, in threat feeds? Do you show up in different places? Right. This is really really low hanging fruit, and and it's just the first way to go. This will take you some time uh, to to get to. Now. The best thing to do is take a look at the work that you've already done um, str strictly in security, right? So you've, you've probably done external pen tests, you've probably done maybe even some internal pen tests. Go back and take a look at all the pen tests you can find over the last couple of years and start to look not just at um, do the same things keep coming up in pen tests. That's you know obviously something to think about. Um, but when you get the findings, have you made tickets for each one of those, those findings? And have you actually remedi remediated all those tickets? And if not, why not? And you know, are they still open? Um, did, did you declare ticket bankruptcy and you just got rid of it because it was too hard? Uh, that's a, by the way, if, if you had to declare a ticket bankruptcy, that is an absolutely like first rate indicator that you've got more tech debt, more tech debt than you can handle. Um, if, you, if you start to see across a number of different projects that, that new, things get abandoned because they are really hard because there's all these blockers. Fantastic indicator that you've got tech debt that is blocking your way and you're going to have to deal with it. Um, what do the findings or what do they tell you about the kinds of bugs that testers continually surface? So they might be a little bit different, but if they're all of the same ilk and just to make it really simple, you know, if it's cross-site scripting, why is that, why does that keep on happening? Um, and, and that can go back to a bunch of different things like testing and training. It can go back and, and by the way, if you're, if you're getting back into that and you're starting to look into code repos, then all these things will end up with different rabbit holes. You know, the, the, the next thing that I want to, that I'll probably want to dig into and, and these things will just pop out at you, right, is, well, if I'm not looking at my code and I'm not testing my code, am I burying static credentials in my code? Um, ask the question uh, if you're not looking for it. GitHub is, is giving us a bunch of help, but a lot of times you'll find things in there. Um, and, you know, tech debt begets tech debt. So the first thing you really want to do is find out what you got and then just keep following the holes until you're at the end. It's the same thing with vulnerability scans, right? Um, look for the patterns, they will pop out. Um, and, and it isn't, I don't want to get, you know, wrapped around the axle about the fact, you know, you've got 1900 criticals and they're high and critical and it's really terrible. I'm actually more interested in whether you understand and whether your people understand why you haven't patched. Because if you, if there is a process where you've just said, okay, you know, those are critical, but they're actually just bullshit. Like that, that's not anything that we really care about. Um, you know, Tenable thinks it's critical, but we don't think it's critical because of X, Y, and Z. That's totally fine. That's a, that's really good actually. Um, but if you have accepted it because it hurts your head to think about all the different tickets that you would have to fill and and answer and and get done and all the sprints that it would take just to stop blocking the thing that's that's preventing you from, um, from, from patching those systems, that's huge in terms of finding tech debt. It's just not okay, right? If, you're, if you can't write it all up in one ticket, that's a big problem. Once you've done that, the next step is to look at the processes of logging and disaster recovery. And it, your questions here are really just over and over can I, can I do what I think? What's the difference between what I think I can do and what I can actually do and why? And, and you just have to keep asking those questions. Um, the, the very first thing to do is find out what you promise other people that you do. And it's, it's never, you know, it's never fun, but sit down with the business, sit down with legal, sit down and take a look at what you've said you do. Um, maybe, maybe you can promise people something or even worse, you've attested to something. Um, and just have a good understanding as you go in and look at this uh, about what your promises have been. And then the questions that you're asking are, am I, am I logging what I think I'm logging? Am I really sure? Um, the best way to do this is through use cases. And, you know, I, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. You know, if you, if you have uh, an e-commerce site, then it's, all right, uh, customer comes on, they sign in, 
they browse, they pick three items, they put them in their shopping cart, they pay, their credit card comes back uh, as not good, they put in another credit card, they pay, it's successful, we send out the email. Okay, show me the logs for that entire experience. What is missing from that entire experience? And it's fine, whatever it is is missing is missing, you just have to know it. Um, and, and you know, if you're, if you're in a bank, obviously it's gonna be different, every business is different. But what you wanna do is find real use cases that are simple, just dead simple. Like this is what we do every day and run through and see if you can find that process in your logs and find the black holes. There's gonna be black holes, there's always black holes, but just find out what they are, identify them, and then think about what you wanna do. Um, you know, are, are you looking at DNS? Are you looking at auth logs for everything? Can you do it for certain dates and times? If not, why not? Those are the questions. Um, however long you're retaining logs, it's not really, the, the retention period are, it, it is not really that important unless you're regulated. If you're regulated, are you, are you really doing it for all of them? But give yourself realistic use cases. Um, you know, if you keep 30 days in sort of live stuff, go back 27 days and see if you can actually do what I just said. And if not, find out why, but figure out what's, what's the delta between your expectation and the on the ground truth. Failover tests are really telling. Uh, those are the ones that everybody hates to do because they're hard and they're, they're terrible and things can go wrong and it's, you know, it's, it's awful. But um, think you want to look at failover tests less being about compliance or your annual attestation that you've done it and more about going, right? You know, if, if you get hit by ransomware tomorrow, what would happen? And what would you, what's the situation that you'd be in and why? And start to, to catalog why. And the issues of your last DR failover test are, this is a gold mine. And this is, it's a deep and rich gold mine. And this is going to give you months of work to try to figure out what is going on and, and why it isn't where you think it should be, because it almost never is. Um, I was just talking to my friend Ian, he's at Simpress, and he was telling me that Reed Hastings would go through the data centers, um, you know, watching Netflix on a, on a mobile phone and like just yanking out arbitrary cables to see what happens. And it, I don't care if it's true. It's a great story. It's, it's not where any of us are, um, but it's a tremendously fantastic place to be in terms of resilience. And if you can get there with resilience, or if you can think about that's where you want to get with resilience, those questions I just, we just put out there, right? That's, that's how you get there. You, you never take anything for granted and you always understand the reality of where you are. And that's really critical. When the customer sends you the spreadsheet because their procurement weasels have decided that they don't understand what you have and they send you the million question spreadsheet from help, it's a good thing. It's a better thing if you do this yourself. And so if you haven't gone to VSA, the Vendor Security Alliance and downloaded their, I think it's like a hundred questions. They have a full and a core. I think the core is like 80 questions, the full maybe 120 questions. It's all the questions that anybody who wants to deal with third party risk is gonna be asking. And they're very, very straightforward. And most of the answers are binary. Do you do this, yes or no? Do you do this, yes or no? If you don't do it, are there any compensated controls? If so, list them. Going through that and taking the time to do it, it should, it should the fastest I've seen it is six hours. Uh, the, the longest I've seen it, or normally what I get is I could take people about a week to go through this. These questions are, because they're of critical importance to your customers, they're, they're of critical importance to you. It's a really great reality check. It's also really good to have it on hand to give to business development people, salespeople, and say the first time you have a meeting with your customer and it looks like they're asking you for a trial or it might go to contract, give them this. Give them our spreadsheet. Give them our, our documentation about our security. Let, let their procurement weasel see that we actually care about this. And now they're going to look at you a little bit differently and they're not going to feel like they have to, you know, eke everything out from you. Um, so there, there's, there's no real prize. That's, that's about as much of a prize as that you'll get for filling in those spreadsheets. There's a huge penalty for being wrong, right? Because that, that question that I asked about um, SSL or, or TLS, that's going to be in there. And, and so answering that spreadsheet will give you a lot of the answers and it's just fantastic for finding tech debt. Just doing the steps that I've said, and you know, I only have half an hour, so just doing those steps will take most people four to six months to actually flesh those out. If you've never done this before, um, I know that many of these might seem obvious, and if you're in a sophisticated organization, you know, you've probably done a lot of these things. Um, I have been in very large organizations that haven't done this. I've been in very small organizations that have, right? Um, 
when I've gone into incident response uh, over the years, almost every single incident response I've ever done was a, a byproduct of, of some kind of tech debt that, that I've just, that would have been called by, by those things. And again, it, it goes from very, very large companies to very small companies. It doesn't make a difference. It's, this stuff is hard, so people don't like doing it. Um, I want to talk, touch a little bit on cloud configuration because um, it's a vague concept. Everybody's multi-cloud. I don't know what your cloud is. Some people do lift and shift. Some people are, are completely infrastructure as code. We are, wherever you are in there, um, you're still probably going to have some technical debt. Um, the most important question, just, just from a, a theoretical perspective is, how are your, whatever it is that you're running, how are they configured uh, and, and are you doing it against the baseline? And what's the reality on the ground? So however many you have, um, and, and is it meeting the expectations of your baseline and you? And if you haven't done this, first thing Monday, go out and get either Scout Suite, which is free, or Cloud Conformity, which got bought by Trend Micro. Uh, get the, I think they have a free trial. Run it, just run it, and it will dump it out really, really fast. It is the most eye-opening, breathtaking thing you'll ever see, because it'll show you any, everything in your cloud environment and how it's configured, and it'll be set. It'll it'll sit there and tell you, you know, 41% of your snapshots are not encrypted, and you know, a bunch of your instances are not encrypted, and and they're sending things out, or your firewalls are misconfigured. Whatever it is, you'll get a list. And uh, with cloud conformity, it's actually done in low, medium, and high, and critical, which is really, really nice. Um, so that's that's something really to do to get a sense of where you are in in, in your cloud configuration. Find out. That's the most important, and then dig in. I will leave you on this. It's, this is like New York City, it'll be a nice city when it's done. Tech debt is not done. You're, it's not a project that you do once and you're done unless you're really unlucky. It's a process and it, it absolutely has to be. So there are literally, there's two ways to deal with it. You do it constantly alongside development and collaboratively with all of, of dev. Or you don't do that and you accumulate so much tech debt that you get to a point where you have to stop everything and shut down for a month or two months or three months and go back and fix everything and just refactor everything. And then you'll go and do it constantly as an effort alongside dev. There is no third option. These are your only options. So it's, and I will say this, like people say, well, that's really hard or that's really expensive, or I don't have the resources to do that. It will never be easier or cheaper to do this than it is today. Every day you wait, it gets harder and more expensive to do it. You should start today. One thing that I'm doing now, and we're, we're just starting this, so I can't really tell you if it's successful, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it will be, uh, is thinking about embeds and, and forward deployment. Um, what we're doing is getting forward deployment of developers from every squad into security. So they will come and they'll come to our standups and uh, ultimately we'll send our security engineers into their standups once a week. It's not, it's nothing serious, but, but what we end up with is we, we start to, to get collaboration. We start to get evangelism on both sides and we start to really get to know some of the people who are making decisions. Um, I would, I would recommend that you get people who think it's cool who think that it's interesting, who think that it's fun. If you just, if you force somebody and frog march them into our standup, it's not really gonna be very, very productive, but there is at least one person in every squad who's going to be, uh, who, who's gonna think that this is neato. That's the guy you want. Um, and another thing is embedding. We're, we're making um, SSRE, site, uh, security site reliability engineer. Um, if we think about, since I said we're infrastructure as code, if we think about our security, not from a standpoint of guys in hoodies, but like guys in, um, uh, guys who are looking for resilience, guys who are looking to, to make things work, then, then it really comes down to security by virtue of excellent configuration. That's really what the bottom line is. And the only way that I think that that can really work is if we are you know, hand in glove with SRE, because they're, they are where the rubber meets the road. And, uh, in some ways, so are we. So having a security site reliability engineer, somebody who who stands up with SRE, but but is really mainly focusing on the parts of our infrastructure that are directly related to security, we're we're thinking that that's uh, going to be a, a very successful role. I am now uh, done with my presentation. No, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I I thought of this because you actually, when the military did this, um, they they found that reporters they got better reporting. 
um, because the reporters actually had skin in the game. Now, sometimes that, that, that meant that the, the reporters were throwing it in on the side of the military, they were biased towards the military, but a lot of times what it really meant was that the reporters had a better contextual understanding of what was happening. That's what I'm seeking here. I think it's really, really clever uh, as, a way of, as a way to work. So here's my contact information and I will um, be available right now if anybody has any questions for me right now. All right, does anybody have anything to enter into the Q&A window? If not, feel free to reach out to Nick with any questions. We're going to be posting the recordings and the slides here in the next couple days uh, on corncon.tv. And uh, I'll let you go, Nick. I appreciate your coming and, and giving a great presentation today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care.